Okay, thank you. I would like to give a short progress report, raise questions, because this is an ongoing quest, uh, project, uh, certainly uh, on fourth and new synthesis, something I'm doing with uh, Andrew Reed, and I um, will talk mainly about the software side. Andrew has been concentrating on uh, the hardware side. Um, I presented Seedforce quite a while ago, and there's a small inner kernel, and we're about to uh, discuss uh, uh, with this guidance uh, on how to implement this in hardware. I will not talk about that, but I will talk a little bit of what fourth synthesis is. So uh, I found that in traditional four systems that um, um, many pieces are present and they are very well combined in a way that they shape a very nice uh, uh, environment. And um, I, I was always curious on how do these things actually work. So the idea of the new synthesis is, whoops, to disaggregate these pieces, uh, watch it then in isolation, see how they work, and uh, maybe then reassemble them uh, in the synthesis to maybe new shapes that might uh, be suitable. I think that uh, experienced force programmers do this anyways, um, but um, uh, looking at the application and uh, when we heard the story of Charles Moore, how he worked uh, in the early days, uh, then it was just this. He looked at the application and the task to do, and then he revised everything uh, to, to uh, fit it perfectly. And uh, so we do this mainly for understanding. And so what is the latest word uh, work? I have been investigating in input output. Yeah. So how does input work in fourth and uh, how does output work um, and what can we do with that? Yeah, and I'm watching, uh, I've been observing the connection between host and target. What we just discussed, uh, uh, had I known that this discussion, I would have presented uh, the great slide on uh, how to split uh, the bit different parts between host and target, compiler, interpreter, and um, mass storage, and editor, and so on. A nice picture I can show uh, uh, at some later time then. Um, I've been looking at uh, host and targets, especially how they com can communicate commands. Things that uh, we also did uh, 20 years ago, but again, it's um, disaggregating, looking at the parts and understanding what's going on. One outcome of this is screens. Um, blocks don't need to be one kilobyte. You can store source code in screens uh, also if you use form feed separated files and the nice outcome is that the traditional bnl list load um, through index uh, interface that we use from early block systems can also work with stream files that are form feed separated that have screens so that's really great and then uh, you can have the very nice work environment and I want to talk today about current work, uh, playing with Unicode, and I hope Nick is still with us uh, so we can look at the examples that I came up with and disaggregating stacks and memory to get some more insight there. So playing with Unicode, um, uh, uh, in his talk, Nick uh, said, well, uh, we can define Unicode names. Uh, I need to play around with it. I can only go, don't type the appropriate letters in there and I've been thinking of what would be beneficial here. Maybe an arrow uh, so that we can write to, uh, we can uh, write an array arrow that, that we can write 42 to x for example, instead 42 to to x uh, 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 or s to d in this way or oh, well then you can think of and play around. Look at the words that you might want to change and uh, give them some symbolic, more symbolic name. Hmm, maybe Greek letters is probably a good thing like delta T uh, so that you can uh, define things uh, more like this. And of course, this can be overstressed. Uh, if you use symbols that uh, no one understands really, then uh, it, it would become difficult. So maybe uh, when we have operator sequences, you want to combine this to a single symbol and then you can use it. Hmm, that might be very nice. But as soon as you start using the strange arrows um, uh, with hooks on them or, or whatever, then I believe the fourth programs will become more 
uncomprehensible than they are uh, at some times anyways. So, um, or you could uh, say, and uh, this is uh, uh, maybe what Klaus did in the early 80s, uh, he used uh, brackets for control structures, uh, and you can use Unicode characters as well. Um, and then you can uh, maybe define a case statement like this, where uh, um, case and case is these brackets, and off and off is uh, uh, the uh, the triangles. And then, yeah, you can judge whether this is nice or not. Uh, I think this is very doubtful. So, um, yeah, anyway. So uh, maybe something to discuss later on. Um, Let's talk about disaggregating the stacks. Uh, I said uh, earlier that um, in force uh, things are very cleverly combined. So if you look at the data stack and the return stack, they are not used for single purpose, but for multiple purposes in different situations. Yeah, and if we disaggregate them, then maybe we can uh, uh, look at each of these purposes in isolation and better understand what's going on. As an example, the data stack is used for parameter passing in interpreting mode, and you store integer character flows and addresses there. In compiling mode, it's not used for parameter passing, but uh, sometimes it's used for uh, as a control flow stack to calculate the branch addresses for control structures or for compiler security to see if you nest these things uh, appropriately. Or uh, Matthias Koch uses constant folding um, uh, on the data stack during compilation uh, of the data stack for that. Mm. When we execute programs, yeah, then we do parameter passing and things, uh, things like that. If we look at the return stack, then it stores internal return addresses so that we can do the nesting, unnesting of words. But in when we execute our program, we use uh, to R and R from or R a lot uh, um, to allocate storage or use temporary storage on the return stack. We use it for loop parameters. We use it for exception frames and we use it for locals on some systems, um, different purposes. And now the idea is disaggregate this, um, uh, do the individual pieces. So, um, yeah, and uh, let's see uh, what we want is, uh, yeah, we have interference uh, between these different purposes. And this, uh, if, for example, in the standard, leads to a lot of restrictions uh, of what we can do. Yeah, we can't pass parameters to a definition at compile time because that interferes with a possible control flow stack that is on the uh, parameter stack. We can't use to R and R from across two loops because it interferes with storage, uh, uh, temporary storage and loop parameters and so on. You know about that. Um, and we had this large discussion of whether we want to have a floating point stack um, uh, combined with the data stack or separate. And yeah, this leads us to something. Maybe that's what we want. We want to disaggregate the stacks and split Uli, the stack Uli, into individual Uli. things. Yes. Uli, what do you mean by disaggregating? I yeah, this is, what I, this is what I explained in the very first slide. We cut things into pieces and lock them in, into, in, in individual parts. So we cut now the stacks into different pieces for the pur different purposes that it's used to. And we have different stacks. Yeah, A stack for control flow, uh, a stack for temporary data, a stack for loop parameters, and a, a stack for exception handling, and so on. So now we have a multitude of stacks, and then later we, we see uh, where can we recombine them because they don't interfere anymore or not. not. But that's ongoing. Uh, I, don't, uh, I cannot present results here right now. But the idea is, while well, we look at uh, the use of the stacks, see it's not that simple. It's used for many different things. Let's separate these things. So disaggregating is uh, separation of concerns and trying to find out uh, uh, and look at them in isolation, find out what they really uh, are to be. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, that's a pass forward for disaggregating this, uh, aggregating the stacks, separating them in uh, and and observing them in detail and find out uh, what they are, the the essential is. Last thing is um, um, disaggregating memory. Yeah, and I'm so happy that uh, Brad talked about RAM-ROM systems because that's also something we've been discussing. Memory, fetch and store, is not the same in all places. Uh, yeah, we have RAM and ROM, we have initialized uh, RAM and we have uninitialized RAM, maybe even that. 
So classically, if you look at uh, the definition of buffer, there's also huge discussion. Why don't we just, uh, why do we have a word for it if it's just create a lot yeah, or builds a lot, yeah, maybe even that. But um, uh, in RAM-ROM systems, uh, that's a difference. And uh, because uh, you want to allocate the uh, buffer in RAM, and normally if you create a comma something, that's um, uh, allocated in ROM. So here we disagree with memory. We look at ROM and we look at RAM and get some more in detail uh, understanding of what's going on. And I came up with a policy of doing defining words uh, where I actually uh, tried in my mind to separate RAM definition and ROM definitions, even on a system that uh, doesn't distinguish RAM and ROM. Yeah, and uh, so instead of create a lot, I would today probably define something like this, uh, where I first define what is supposed to be uh, in RAM, and in a RAM-ROM system will go in RAM. And um, there's a convention that here and a lot uh, will deal with uh, RAM addresses and uh, create will create a ROM address and comma will also and C comma will uh, allocate in ROM. If you don't have the distinction, then it's all in the same address space. But if you have the distinction, then uh, it's clear. No false, for example, does it exactly like that. And Matrix doesn't do it like this, which uh, causes lots of problems. Uh, and then you can uh, allocate uh, the uh, thing in RAM, the buffer in RAM. It has the uh, appropriate characters in there. And then you create and uh, the address that you got, um, uh, that's what you comma in the ROM section. Yeah, And so you have two uh, distinct kinds of memories. In, in a uh, unified system with RAM ROM unified, uh, it's just different areas. Um, and uh, uh, then, then it works. And then you can take this code. It runs on a desktop system. It also runs on a. Uh, RAM ROM system, so that's nice, and of course you, we we need probably have uh, builds here. Um, that that's uh, true, um, and then you could think about what you do with constant, um, uh, yeah, because create uh, does fetch is actually constant, um, or create comma does fetch uh, is actually constant. So that's uh, uh, my contribution for today. Um, many open questions and room for discussion. Uh, but I believe we can um, uh, find interesting things in, especially this RAM-ROM distinction, um, uh, when Brad also has these kinds of concerns. Maybe we come and finally get another step forward and see what's going on. And I, I have in mind Stephen's contribution or Stephen's remark of what happened there already. So thank you very that's it. much. I'm Olli. open for uh, for it. Questions? Can I remark short remarks? Yes. Can I please re-emphasize this? Please do questions and short remarks. And I would suggest we will have a, a discussion panel as there is great interest after all the impromptu talks. So if you have any remarks, uh, please let uh, Uli know that now. Uli, I've got a very short one coming from myself while I wait for the others to show up on Twitch. Uh, how do you actually enter Unicode in a way which is not cumbersome? Because normally you need kind of programs or a separate test, uh, keyboard. How do you do it in a good way? Uh, in a good way, I don't know. Uh, I am using a Mac and the Mac has a, actually a, a dialogue, a panel, yes. where you can Search for characters if you want to. You, you can type in arrow and you see all the arrows, or you type in bar, you see all the bars or heart, or or you can go uh, for the for the emojis, um, or whatever you prefer, uh, or you have a panel with Greek characters. And once you have them, then I copy and paste. Yes. Okay. I was afraid of that. <laughs> I, I think it, it's really hard to make Unicode typeable easily. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a question from uh, Twitch Ulrich. Uh, is there a way where you've been uh, conducting discussions about different stack types? I think he has done several uh, uh, presentations on that, but please only take it away. Maybe you also want to point to the package. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know what what stack types, floating point stack versus uh, other stacks or ah, the different yeah the different stack types. Uh, no, there is nothing uh, I have written up. But right now, so it's ongoing uh, discussion, and you're happy to join and contact uh, us uh, directly. And eventually, there will be a paper on one of the course conferences, and then uh, yeah, this will the way it, it's, it will be documented. Is that a good answer? I don't he know. says this. <laughs> 
Disambigu disambiguation discussion. Um, yeah. Well, uh, I think you have to wait for Uli's talk about that. Um, you can, I can only point you to the, the, the force.net. There is Uli's uh, attempt also on stack of stacks, which I think has it had different concept, but it also tries to make some structures on the stack itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, Anton has raised his hand. Please, Anton. Yeah, my uh, impression is that the point of uh, buffer column is about the differentiation or disaggregation between initialized and uninitialized RAM, not uh, not mm -hmm. directly related to some ROM. Mm -hmm. Okay, could be. Or maybe, uh, I guess it has to do with ROM because the, in, in a ROM system, the initialized uh, RAM comes from ROM, uh, the mm -hmm. initialization mm -hmm. value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so my distinction between RAM and ROM uh, only talks about uninitialized RAM and initialized ROM, of course, uh, uh, and ROM. And then your program has to have an uh, initialization word that sets up all the RAM the way you want. Okay, uh, next one was Philip Sembrot. Please go ahead. So, <clears throat> what would be your thought in a system with uh, very limited RAM if you have five different stacks, uh, let's um, assume, or four, or four different stacks? And you need to allocate an area for each of them and you make a hard decision okay this one gets 1k this one gets 2k yeah and sure. your decision proves wrong no you you won't do that so uh this uh, splitting of the stacks is uh for getting the inside and then later if you see rk uh, uh here they are synchronized uh they need to be synchronized and then you can combine them um, and if you see, uh, I want to use them uh, independently, uh, they could interfere, then you can think of, do you combine them? And then you know what you're getting because this restricts the kinds of programs that you can write, or you have it separately. No, in an, a small embedded systems, you, you won't have all these different stacks uh, with uh, pre-allocated memory. You will try to recombine them uh, in an in a, uh, appropriate way. And how that is the idea of the new synthesis to understand how we can do that, where you want to combine it, what and what effects do you actually get from that? Okay, thank you. Uli. Can I just add? And, can, uh, I just, can I just can I just add to that, please? Mm -hmm. Sure. It's the in many cross-compiled systems you have the ability to specify for each task or interrupt or thread the the size of each unit so you could you for example you can def individually define the sizes of the two date of the two stacks the size of the user area and whether or not you have a float stack and so on mm -hmm. yeah yeah and and th then the question is uh maybe you have engineering knowledge uh, experience of how to do that and uh, we really want to uh, get this and eventually document this. Uh, what is the best practice in doing so? Yeah, combining uh, uh, combining the control flow stack and the data stack well leads to not being able to pass uh, parameters in definitions or difficult uh, uh, to do so. Yeah, 